All right, good, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna get started with today's policy meeting of the uh, Phoenix City Council. We had a long executive session before this, so sorry we're getting started a few minutes uh, late. Uh, it appears that we have a quorum of the uh, Phoenix City Council. We're gonna start the meeting uh, today with asking council members if they have any information and or follow-up requests that they'd like to present to uh, the community. Councilman Williams, do you have any information or follow-up requests? I, I do, Mayor. I Please. wanted to tell everybody that May 14th is the grand opening at the Radisson at Metro Center. They have totally remodeled the old hotel and they are anxiously waiting for more customers to come in. So drop by uh, the grand opening, see the remodeling job. I think you're gonna be very, very pleased. May 20th, um, is when the women on the council are hosting the Professional Women's Networking Luncheon. And our speaker will be Governor Jan Brewer. So if you need more information or you want to RSVP, please call my office at 602-262-7444. And I want to remind all of you guys, don't forget this weekend's Happy Mother's Day. So better get your shopping done early. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Councilwoman. So the Radisson at Metro Center is reopening. I'm gonna date myself by saying this, but uh, when I was a kid, uh, that's where the NBA teams would stay when they were playing the Phoenix Suns. And I uh, spent many a uh, hour outside waiting to get autographs from Michael Jordan and other uh, great NBA players at Metro Center many years ago. Well, now yeah. it's up to the standard it used to be when you used to visit there. <laughs> Councilman Gates, did you have any uh, information or follow-up requests? I do. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, I want to make sure to say Happy Mother's Day uh, to my mom. Uh, looking forward to seeing her uh, later this week. Um, we've got a lot, to, lot going on. We're excited to announce the Remembering the Fallen Memorial exhibit is going to be thanks to um, our city manager, Ed Zerker. It will be in the City Hall atrium uh, during uh, city business hours from May 18th through June 1st. It will be free to view. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Remembering uh, the Fallen Memorial exhibit, this memorial honors uh, and remembers all the Arizonans who made the ultimate sacrifice both in Iraq and Afghanistan since September 11th, 2001. Uh, on May 12th, we'll be holding our coffee chat at the Moon Valley Cafe, which is at 502 West Thunderbird. Uh, that will be from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning. And uh, we will have guests who will be coming from the Phoenix Public Library, and we'll also have a speaker who, who will be talking more about the Remembering the Fallen uh, Memorial Exhibit. This Saturday, uh, we will be celebrating Bootleggers' second anniversary party. That at Bootleggers is a great uh, restaurant that's opened uh, near the 32nd, North 32nd Corridor. It's at 3375 East Shea Boulevard, and that will begin at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we'll also have a free hands-on paint sprayer training uh, that's going to be offered to help residents keep their neighborhoods graffiti free, and that will be at the NSD uh, West Facility 3320. West Flower Street. And then we're also going to be having a community volunteer cleanup of the Cave Creek Wash in District 3. We do need more volunteers for that. That's going to be Saturday, May 9th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, and gloves, tools, trash bags will be provided and uh, everyone will be meeting at 10th Avenue and Grand View. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Council. Um, and Gates, Councilman DeCicci, do you have any uh, information or follow-up requests? Uh, just a couple, Mayor. Thank you. Um, and to my mom, happy Mother's Day, Mom. She turned 87 last week. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's you know definitely getting up there in age. You know, God bless her. She's been a great mom. And then for those of uh, you that are moms out there, I uh, hope you're having a great one, uh, depending on when this airs. I hope you're having an enjoyable one. I, you get uh, sometimes at times... You don't get the level of respect you think you get from your children, but everything that you do for us is very much appreciated. Uh, you do more than enough. I mean, if you look at my wife. Happy Mother's Day to her as well. Uh, she just carries the ball in our family, always there for their homework, always there to pick them up, always there to do all the work. Um, you know, a lot of us always forget about how much a mom really does in the household, and they run the show. You know, I told this to some of my friends early on. I said, look, at the end of the day, you think you have a say. You do, 
but they make the final decision. <laughs> and that's one of those times you just got to give it up. So, you know, happy Mother's Day to everybody. Uh, the Arcadia Neighborhood Association is a Saturday, uh, for those of you that are viewing this. Um, you know, hopefully you can come on out there if you're from Arcadia. We got a couple of hot issues out there for obvious. Uh, you can read about it in the newspaper with the Wright House. Uh, and uh, hopefully we're going to have, uh, probably they generally have about 100 or so people out there. And I think the staff generally does a pretty good job. It's their annual meeting. Uh, TJ, if you could stand up. Ratchet. Uh, TJ has been shadowing me. He's from Mountain Point High School. And just a little bit of background on him. He is only uh, 18 years old. He's already started his own business. And Danny, we came by earlier to uh, Councilman Valenzuela's office uh, to talk to you, let you know. But he's going to be going and attending Grand Canyon University next year, inter uh, international entrepreneurism. And uh, he's done outstanding work. He gets good grades, good. Uh, literally runs everything on himself. It's amazing how much responsibility TJ has, and he's been learning a lot today, I think. And we've really had an enjoyable time for him coming out. Um, this is to staff. I know we've got this strong emphasis in making sure we hire women in the workplace here, especially in those non-traditional jobs. One of the areas that we really were short on was, I think it was 5% of our firefighters are women. I'd like to get an idea of where we're at with that process. Uh, how many applicants do we have in that are women? Uh, how many of them are making it to the final push? What I'd like to do is get an idea of where we're at today, since we've got, we're on a hiring um, uh, phase right now at the city of Phoenix, especially in the fire department. I wanna see at the end of the day, how many of those are going to be women? And I wanna, you know, especially since that, that was the focus at the time. If you could do that, it'd be great. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman, and congratulations, TJ. I was just at GCU yesterday. It's a great university, one of many that we have here in the state, and uh, the Colangelo School of Business is just one of the one of the best choices you could uh, you could make. So, congratulations, uh, Councilman Pastor. Announcements? Sure. Okay. So, uh, on Sunday, Happy Mother's Day to all those mothers. Uh, as a uh, Councilman. Uh, DeCicio was saying we do not always get uh, the praises that we would like and all the nice comments because we take it all internal. And uh, it's great to have a day to at least celebrate with our kids and our family and uh, be appreciated. So to all the mothers that uh, sit up here, mm -hmm. uh, congratulations and have a happy day. Um, I also like to thank all everyone that attended our District 4 ride through the neighborhood. I especially like to thank uh, Rick Namark and Ray for showing up and supporting me. Uh, we did 12 miles, uh, 12 miles through District 4. I did find some areas. This is a great way to find areas about your streets and, um, and areas where there needs to be some lighting. So we will be discussing that, but we had a wonderful morning. Started off at 8.30 and got back by 10 o'clock and then had brunch. And so it was really fun and exciting to do. It's a great way to talk to neighbors too and hear their, their feedback of what's happening in the city, what they appreciate. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is on uh, once a month every Sunday when department, uh, uh, managers want to talk to me they have to meet me somewhere to go right through the neighborhood so uh, it's f about fit Phoenix so um, just want to thank everybody <clears throat> tonight at six o'clock we're going to have a bike lane informational public meeting and it's taking place at Longview Elementary School in the auditorium uh, the purpose of the meeting is to discuss the changes planned for the roadway striping and the impl implications of the traffic area so please join if you have an opinion about it please please uh, show up at the Longview Elementary School uh, reminder once again, registration for Community Center, Center Summer Programs that begin the last Saturday of April 25th at 10.30. Registration uh, for Summer Aquatic Programs will be on Thursday, May 14th at 6.30. Please come join. Uh, those that are looking, I'm, in addition to that, those that are looking for employment in the parks area, please uh, get onto our website and apply. Um, <clears throat> And then we're going to have our uh, 
historic neighborhood summit that was uh, started by Councilman Nowakowski. And this year's event will be uh, with Councilwoman Gallego, Councilman Nowakowski and I will be hosting uh, the summit. And that will be May 30th from 9 to 11 at Kenilworth. And uh, it's a free, it's open to the public and it's free. So please come in and let's talk about um, our historic homes. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Councilman Pastor, Councilman Waring. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, every year we do a budget hearing after the budget has taken a more firm shape. So Mario Panoagua, our budget uh, director, is going to be attending our meeting at the Paradise Valley Community Center, which is at 40th Street, uh, just north of Bell, just north of Paradise Valley High School, which is there on that northwest corner. So if you want to come out at 6 p.m. on May 14th, we really appreciate Mario doing this again, and hopefully we'll have a, a big turnout. Um, talk about the budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Waring. Councilman Nowakowski. You know, Smith Park just went over um, a makeover, and I really want to thank the um, Texas Roadhouse for investing $37,000 in improvements. You know, it was really coming together and renewing the uh, Ramada. We, um, they resurfaced the basketball courts. They painted the old um, community center, and they actually created a community garden. And all this was possible because of our staff really reaching out there and, and finding those good community partners like the um, Texas Roadhouse that um, gave back to the community. You know, I really want to thank Michael Hammett and from um, Neighborhood Services and the volunteer program because it was all those volunteers that went out there on a Monday morning. It really worked from sun up to sundown to make this all possible. They planted 12 trees and did all this great stuff in a really needy community. And also, I really want to thank um, Olga Soto from um, Neighborhood Services also for helping out and making it possible. The other thing I like to do is um, I want to remind everyone that last year we had this um, Memorial Day event at Cesar Chavez um, Park where we honored all the fallen officers, all 48 officers. And then we had a Heroes Lane going from 35th Avenue all the way to 51st Avenue where we had um, banners on all the street poles with the uh, fallen officers. Um, this year there was a request to actually extend that Heroes Lane to downtown. So we're gonna actually have two different um, Hero Lanes this year. We're gonna continue the 35th to 51st Avenue for individuals that live in the southwest um, part of our city and for individuals that live in the central part of our city from I think it's 7th Avenue all the way to about 7th Street all the way to 9th Avenue will be having a Heroes Lane so you'll have on all the different um, light poles you'll have all the different fallen officers and it's a time for us to remember those individuals that have given their lives for us and it's a time for our young people to really understand what it is to put on that uniform every day and to risk their lives. And we have a website because one of the things that we were asked for last year is people want to know information about these fallen officers. And we had schools that would actually take field trips and go to each officer and do a little history or a little um, bio on each one of them. So this year we created a website. It's um, www.phoenixheroes.org. So you can actually look up all those fallen officers and, and read about those heroes we have in the city of Phoenix. Also, um, we're gonna be having a Fiesta de Mayo. It's gonna be one of the biggest um, Cinco de Mayo fiestas, but it's a little combination of Cinco de Mayo, Mother's Day, and we're having a soccer tournament. We have about 125 soccer teams um, participating in the tournament, and we're gonna end it with a big Cinco de Mayo fiesta. And on Sunday, we're gonna end it with a Mother's Day event. So we're expecting about 30,000 people out at the um, West Side um, uh, sports complex. So if you're around McDowell and 99th Avenue, come on down. It's going to be a great event. Um, the proceeds go back into the community. We're trying to raise about $100,000 to give back in scholarship for um, Dream Act kids. So if you have a chance, come on down, participate, and the proceeds go to a good cause. The other thing is on May 16th, we're going to be having a moving the park at Cesar Chavez. It's going to be the closing um, ceremonies for the Levine baseball. So if you're out in Levine on May 16th, come on down and watch a movie and, and see the ceremonies of the um, Levine Little League out there. And finally, I just really want to thank um, all the mothers that are out there. Um, and I want to thank my wife 
one of the sayings we have in the Naukowski house is when mama's happy, everyone's happy. So <laughs> make sure your mom's happy so the whole family's happy. So God bless you all and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, and happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out. I too wanna, want to uh, wish everyone a happy Mother's Day. Thank you for everything that I, and my colleagues had some really eloquent words uh, for all the mothers out there and couldn't agree more. Uh, this past weekend, we had a great weekend for the city of Phoenix, the Cinco de Mayo Festival in uh, downtown Phoenix is the largest annual cultural celebration. Uh, this year, more than 70,000 people attended. Uh, this event has been highlighted and is recognized by USA Today as one of the top 10 uh, Cinco de Mayo uh, events that we have right here in the country. And it's, it's exciting to see this event grow. There's just so much going on. Uh, and I do want to thank our Visu Advertising, uh, which is a Latino-owned business. And uh, the Visu family and Grand Canyon University, as we all know, GCU's in uh, District 5. Uh, uh, together, we, we raise funds uh, for scholarships to get kids uh, to school. And uh, this year, once again, we raised more than $100,000 for scholarships. Uh, many of those scholarships we were uh, awarded on the stage before the final music act uh, of the night on Sunday evening. And to see these kids, you know, holding these large checks in front of their, their families, uh, you know, it's always, it's always very special. A lot of these kids are uh, first generation college students. Uh, many are not. Uh, and and uh, the, the bottom line is it's good for all of us. So again, thanks to Ray Arvisu and, uh, and your family, and of course, Grand Canyon University and the city of Phoenix. There are so many city employees out there. Uh, you know, we had uh, police officers and firefighters and, and, uh, and, and everyone else uh, keeping us uh, safe. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's exciting to see, again, see this event continue to grow. Uh, this uh, this month, May 26th, 6 p.m., Helen Drake Senior Center will discuss the Violence Impact Project, the VIP. It's a project for 27th Avenue to uh, address many of the issues that we've had for many, many years, bless you, on 27th Avenue. Uh, various crimes, uh, you know, I mean, frankly, everything from, from uh, drug crimes to prostitution to graffiti or to whatever and uh, we are gaining ground we we, we are very uh, excited about the progress that has been made uh, a lot has been uh, going on I want to thank human services the Phoenix Police Department Phoenix fire uh, and every other uh, NSD several other neighborhood groups coming together uh, working together as part of uh, uh, the uh, West Phoenix revitalization uh, program. And so uh, those efforts continue. Uh, just recently, last week, we met with uh, the interfaith cab cabinet, uh, interfaith clergy cabinet that we have out of District 5. Our clergy uh, are getting involved. Our neighborhood leaders are involved. Uh, and this is just an exciting uh, uh, opportunity to continue to, to keep our community safe, which opens up you know, the doors for a strong economy, it's all relative, and, uh, and I'm really happy with, with the efforts that are, are going on. So uh, we just recently had our second cleanup event, you know, like neighborhood cleanup event in the area uh, over the last weekend, excuse me. Uh, and so this is the next large meeting, May 26, 6 p.m., Helen Drake Senior Center to bring the entire community along the, the first time we did this a couple of months ago we had you know well over 100 people come out uh, everyone is motivated and uh, this is just about keeping our, our community uh, you know clean and safe and and moving forward so you're all welcome to come out um, uh, mayor if I could just mention Please, of course. sorry yeah uh, the the area I forgot to mention is Indian school to Dunlap I-17 to 31st Avenue. So it's not just uh, 27th Avenue. Uh, we do realize that, you know, I, I, 
I, you know, I, I work, I'll, we all do, but I, I lead an effort on uh, an entre entrepreneurship and a uh, conversation I've had with our police department and all of our uh, city departments is, you know, sometimes criminals can be entrepreneurs as well. And, and so what we, you know, what I mean by that is it's not just cleaning up 27th Avenue. We have to figure out where it's going next and we are not going away. Uh, we are looking at other areas as well uh, because we have to stomp this out. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. Any other uh, comments? All right. We'll get started with the uh, agenda for today's meeting. First item is consent agenda. Do we have a consent agenda, Vice Mayor? Yes, we uh, have yeah, consideration of uh, city council approval of multiple city departments to expand in excess of eight hours of time, uh, staff time for coordinating and implementing the city's or Phoenix's innovation games. All right, we have a motion on consent agenda. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Pass, pass unanimously. Do you have a call for an executive session? Yeah, Mayor, in accordance with a properly posted notice and agenda, I move that the City Council pursuant to Arizona Revised Statutes Section 38-431.02.A uh, .A, meet in executive session on Tuesday, May 19th, 2015 at 1 p.m. in the East Conference Room, 12th floor of Phoenix City Hall, 200 West Washington Street, Phoenix, Arizona. Good motion a second, all in favor say aye. Aye. That item passed unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item number two. Uh, item number two is the 2015-16 proposed uh, city uh, budget. Uh, this item is um, for information discussion, are we, are we no planning to vote on this uh, today? In two weeks. In two weeks. So today is the presentation of what will be on the budget. I would obviously give the community an opportunity to formulate whatever thoughts and ideas they have on it. So Mr. City Manager, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. I'd invite you to think back with me to a year previous to today. Last May, we were just concluding a difficult set of budget hearings and employee labor negotiations, compensation agreements, with a budget proposal to close a $37 million deficit. You, as a council, made some tough choices, and we all, as city employees, employees shared solutions to balance that budget with no service reductions. And at that time, you charged me and city management not to come back to the same way this year. So I'm very pleased that, in fact, we are not sitting here today in 2015 similarly. We, in fact, have a different situation. We uh, present a budget that rose to that challenge. It's balanced with no service cuts or tax increases. And in fact, this year, taxes actually decreased with the sunset of the food tax. Uh, further, there are no, not one, none, zero, increases in water, wastewater, or solid waste fees uh, to residents. So I just want to take a moment to let that sink in and congratulate you on the achievement that we have made together. <clears throat> the budget we present today corresponds to community priorities as expressed at budget hearings, and actually it improves some services. We are hiring in public safety again and include better, better training for our police officers. We uh, improve sustainability efforts with increased transit service and solid waste efforts. We have better customer service proposed in our planning and development services departments. And the main message I took from the budget hearings was that our community residents love their community services, including libraries, parks, recreation, arts, streets, bikes, transit. And in fact, our residents want more of it when we are able to do that. To do that. Our residents have a deep affection for the services that employees provide uh, to the community. And it was gratifying to join each of you at those hearings to hear that feedback. So the presentation today, is, as ma the mayor said, is part of the process to meet the charter requirement for a balanced budget. It's a proposed budget today. And then over the next two weeks, the mayor, city council, and community can give any final feedback as you move towards a May 19th vote by the council on adopting a balanced budget. The balanced budget comes about because you made some tough choices early to address the negative impacts we felt this past year. We adjusted revenue and expenditures in September to account for slower economic recovery. You cut vacant positions in December to get 
vacant, to get uh, savings early. And our city employees rose to the occasion in tightening up spending further and continuing to identify cost reductions. And then even when the state threw us a curveball with about $6 million in revenue uh, cuts and uh, new expenses, we managed to, to do that as well. So today, despite challenges, it's my privilege to present to you the work that represents the commitment of all 14,000 city employees, which is to provide outstanding services at an affordable cost. We know that challenges are ahead, particularly with our public safety pension, but this budget sets us up to begin attacking that challenge immediately, as we have already started looking at things like health insurance costs and other drivers to attack before 2016-17. So for details uh, for the community's review, I will now turn to Mario Paniagua, our Budget and Research Director, who will walk you through the specifics. Thank you, Ed, and good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, I will be covering an overview of our community input uh, process for our 2015-16 budget. Uh, this year we held 12 community budget hearings in all the City Council districts. We also take uh, comments from and input from the public through electronic means, through the web and through email. And we actually had quite a few members of the community submit their comments this year uh, through, the, through those means. Uh, in total, we had nearly 350 comments. Our community input process is very important. Our community budget uh, hearings are very important to the residents of Phoenix, and it's a critical aspect of our budget development process each year. And I've, I've got some pictures from uh, some of those from our budget hearings this year that are going to run through as I, as I talk about how those hearings went this year. Uh, very few jurisdictions uh, do what we do to engage the community so fully and so directly in the process of developing each year's budget. Uh, not only do we ask residents for input each year, but we go to them. We go out to their areas where they live in the community, the community centers by them, the schools by them, and we, help, we hold hearings in each of those areas to get their input in a place that they are comfortable in. Uh, so it's a very, very important piece of what we do and how our budget is developed each year. Uh, it's very open. It's very engaging with the public. And uh, as Ed mentioned, the comments from the public demonstrated that the community deems our services very important. Um, and the vast majority of comments actually were requests to increase service levels uh, for the services that we provide. Uh, although additional funding is, is not available in a lot of these areas to provide additional services, uh, we know that these areas are very important to, to our community and we will keep looking at ways that the budget uh, can fund increases to those services in the future. Um, so as you can see, uh, we had a, a decent turnout at those hearings hosted by mayor and members of the council. Uh, we saw each of you at those hearings and you were able to directly engage with the public and hear those concerns, their input, their feedback on the budget. So I'm gonna also talk about what we heard specifically at those hearings. We heard quite a bit about libraries. We heard about libraries at the hearings, but we also heard uh, in our electronic comments that we received, uh, quite a few were about libraries and the fact that a lot of our residents want to see our libraries open on more days of each week. Uh, most of those want them open every day. We have 17 libraries in the city. Two of them are open every day now. The Burton Bar Central Library and the South Mountain Community Library are the only ones that are open each day every week. Of uh, the remaining 15 libraries, eight are open five days a week and the other seven are open uh, uh, six days a week. So we looked at what it would cost to, to increase those, uh, those days that the libraries are open. In order to go from five days to six days with those eight libraries, it would be about half a million dollars. And then in order to take it to the next step of opening uh, all libraries every day would be about another $1.9 million. A total of $2.4 million would be required to open every library every day. Although funding is not available to do that right now, uh, it is something that's important. We know what it would take and we'd be able to discuss um, wh what's involved in going to that level of service. We also heard from the community a great deal about public safety and police officer and firefighter hiring. The great news is that this budget 
does that. This budget includes funding to be able to move forward with police officer and firefighter hiring. 110 police officers are planned to be hired next year, 93 firefighters. That's a direct result of the mayor and council approved public safety hiring plan that you just adopted uh, within the last couple of months. And so a lot of credit goes to you, mayor and council, for staying on track with that public safety balancing plan and getting us to a point where in 2015-16 we will be balanced in our public safety funds. The, uh, the other thing that's in the budget is some training for police officers, $2.2 million. Uh, is uh, allocated is going to be allocated next year to implement a new 40-hour training module with the goal of protecting the safety of the officers and protecting the safety of the public and improving public trust, covering areas like situational and tactical awareness, community and cultural consciousness, mental health response, and other important areas for the for the police department. We heard from the community about recreation, recreation programming needs at city parks and recreation facilities, particularly, particularly in lower income areas of the city. And although there are quite a few needs throughout the city, the budget does uh, have some funding to be able to add year round programming at the Cofelt Lamoureau Recreation Facility uh, near 19th Avenue and Buckeye. Community members also spoke about the importance of arts and culture funding. Specifically, requests were made for additional funding for arts grants, uh, asking that uh, community arts grants reach a level of a dollar per capita. Uh, to reach that level of funding specifically for community arts grants, about $920,000 additional funding each year would be required. Um, but the city does fund uh, arts in many areas. Arts and culture is funded in, in many other areas. In fact, uh, just with arts grant funding, arts grants funding since 2012-13, $530,000 has been added to the budget for community arts grants. 100000 of that is uh, toward rental support grants for, for performing arts facilities. Um, in total, the general fund allocates about $680,000 each year for community and rental support arts grants, which is about $40,000 higher than the general fund amount was in 2007-2008. Um, although the funding uh, for spe specifically for arts grants is not at the dollar per capita level, when we look at the extensive financial support that the city provides to arts and culture, uh, arts and arts, uh, percent for arts program, our arts and culture office, um, uh, all of the aspects that we provide for cultural facilities, together total about $14 uh, per capita. Several bicycle advocates attended our budget hearings to express the need for more bike lanes and bicycle infrastructure throughout the, throughout the city to make biking on city streets easier and safer. Speakers referred to a desired standard of uh, bicycle infrastructure funding of $1.50 per capita. The good news is that the city actually uh, plans more than $12 million in capital street projects for 2015-16 that will enhance bicycle infrastructure. This amounts to more than $8 per capita for next year. One item that had been proposed in, uh, in the budget as a reduction was to discontinue the use of city funds to purchase and assemble 15 mile an hour school zone signs for use by public schools. Uh, however, due to, the due to the importance of this safety tool and concerns that were raised by the community and members of the council, uh, the city will continue to fund these signs. Thank you. Thanks to the uh, work of the Street Transportation Department, uh, who was able to find uh, a savings uh, due to a delayed project that allows them to reduce temporary staffing, we're able to continue funding this with city funds. We also heard from the community about uh, the concerns about a proposed unified city services card. Uh, with many opposed to the prospect of it, uh, the card being used as an identification, um, in the budget is a business analyst position that's uh, to be used for the addition of inno innovation projects, mainly a 311 Phoenix, which is a technology solution to simplify customer requests, complaints, and city contact centers. But if the council were to approve moving forward with the unified uh, city services card, this position would also be used to identify technology needs for that project as well. Park ranger staffing levels was another topic raised at the hearings. 
since 2007-2008, park rangers uh, staffing has been reduced by a total of 26 FTE. At one time there were 81 FTE and now it's down to 55. And the emphasis of park rangers has shifted heavily from regular ongoing enforcement at flatland parks and is now mainly focused on interpretive and education programs, trail maintenance, and resource protection at desert preserves. Uh, members spoke about the need to restore park rangers throughout the city. Uh, we did look at the, what it would take uh, cost-wise or funding-wise to provide that. To restore the additional 26 FTE of park ranger positions would require an additional $2.4 million, and that does include the additional vehicles and equipment that goes along with those, uh, but it's recognized as a high priority for the city, uh, for the community as well. The Arizona Humane Society uh, had representatives present at, at several of our budget hearings to discuss the importance of the city's partnership uh, with the Humane Society in addressing injured and neglected and abused animals in situations arising uh, in police and fire response. At times, these animals involve um, these cases involve animal cruelty, abuse, and neglect for which the criminal justice system relies on the assistance of the Arizona Humane Society. As a result of the input, city staff will work with the Arizona Humane Society in the coming months to implement an improved tracking, tracking of these cases, uh, along with the associated costs to determine the appropriate funding level and responsibility moving forward. And a report will be brought back to the Public Safety Subcommittee in the fall. Just a quick view of, if we look at all of these requests together, uh, that we talked about and what it would take to fund those needs. Uh, we're, we're looking at a total of about $8.6 million annually. The resources that we have available this year are about 300,000. The 300,000 uh, came from refinement of our estimates in the last couple of months as we look toward next year. We saw savings of about $300,000 that's available. We actually recommend holding that for 2016-17 uh, to help offset the, the known increases to public safety pension costs that we will see. Um, so, but this just gives you an idea of how, how large those needs are c compared to what the resources available that we have. There are also some non-general fund additions uh, that are being funded in this budget. Uh, at, the, at the airport, uh, they're adding a small team to review airspace evaluations and potential impacts of possible flight path changes and respond to noise complaints and outreach to the community. And the Transit 2000 Fund uh, is going to begin operation of the Northwest Light Rail Extension, which takes light rail out to 19th Avenue and Dunlap. And Parks and Preserve uh, Initiative Fund funds maintenance of three new uh, desert preserve trailheads at Apache Wash, Desert Vista, and Desert Hills. The Development Services Fund uh, brings improvements to uh, front counter service and electronic plan review and building inspection services. The Solid Waste Fund uh, will begin operating a new composting facility at the 27th Avenue transfer station. So as we look at the general fund in 15-16 compared to 2014-15, we do see that the general fund costs are up about $7.7 .7 million, which is less than 1%. Uh, when we look a little bit deeper about what is part of that, $4.3 million is the new expenses to the state as part of the state's budget balancing actions. Uh, we also included an increase of about $1 million for the contingency fund, which brings the contingency fund to 4% of general fund operating costs and keeps us on track to get to the 5% level. Uh, there's $2.2 million we talked about for expanded police training. The other cost increase areas like civilian pension of $1.3 million, swarm pension uh, being up $6 million, health care up 2.4, are all offset by other savings in the budget and reductions. Uh, so we were able to keep those costs down and less, uh, less than 1% increase. Specifically with general fund revenue, uh, current year we see that the increase for general fund revenue is about 3.3%. Uh, it's temporarily up because the, we know that the full year estimate is going to be closer to 2.3%. We know that there's going to be a year-end adjustment. We know that the food tax uh, will not be there in the final months of the current year. And so those are going to bring that percentage back down. And so we don't recommend any changes to the revenue estimate at this time. Uh, for next year, the general fund budget is based on 
projected revenue growth of about 1%. So as we look toward the future, uh, this, uh, we know we have challenges coming for 16, 17. Uh, we know that uh, we have to start planning and working on that. The five-year forecast shows us that there's a significant deficit and public safety costs are, public safety pension costs are a significant issue for us for, for 2016, 17. Another issue uh, that we want to just bring to, to the council's attention is uh, that all cities throughout the state are discussing and working on a solution for a mid-decade adjustment to population numbers upon which the state shared revenue number uh, revenue estimates are based uh, this will have some negative impact on phoenix because even though we've grown in population uh, other cities have grown at a much faster rate and so this is another challenge on the immediate horizon of 16 17 uh, and demonstrates the importance of the need to to begin working on this now um, in the trial budget presentation, we discussed a list of alternatives and initiatives already underway. Since that time, the Finance, Efficiency, Economy, and Sustainability Subcommittee held a special meeting to specifically talk about ways the city could lower the health insurance costs. Uh, more work is to come on this, uh, but it's uh, possible that considerable savings would come from this. Also in the area of public safety pension, the chief financial officer identified a very prudent financial, financial method of beginning to directly reduce the city's unfunded pension, pension liability by making quarterly uh, prepayments to the state pension system. It does not require an additional budget allocation, but it does allow higher earnings to accrue within the pension fund uh, for a net of about a, a million, a, one and a quarter million dollars per year. The CFO is also working on addressing our debt costs by taking advantage of the city's credit ratings and low interest rates and, ident and refinancing our existing excise tax debt. Uh, this list shows you some of the other areas that we're going to be continuing to work on to aggressively pursue more savings. Uh, and in summary, we do have a balanced budget overcoming a lot of uh, financial challenges uh, that the city's experienced, um, significant revenue reductions and cost increases by the state, increases to public safety pension and health care. Uh, the economy is growing, but revenue growth uh, is estimated at 1% next year. Um, and so the budget is balanced without negatively impacting services. In fact, there are some improvements, and we do begin planning and addressing 2016-17 in this budget. There's no action today. Uh, built into the city's process is this two-week review period from, from today, uh, and on May 19th, we'll be back for a council action on the budget. Uh, Mayor and Council, you deserve much credit for the tough decisions uh, that you have made uh, repeatedly that enable this balanced budget um, and, that, and protects the city services that the community has deemed so important. Uh, this concludes my budget presentation. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Okay, I'll turn it over to um, 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 members of the council at this point. Council Murray, did you have something? So, uh, Mario, the state revenues uh, skyrocketing might be too strong, but but their latest numbers, uh, I think income taxes were up 31% and, and the corporate taxes were up in the 40s. Are we seeing any kind of uptick, uh, given your projections on page 49 and 50? I mean, what would that correlate to based on your experience if things continue that way at the state level? Mayor and Councilman Warren, this, so that's specifically with uh, the income tax. We did, mm -hmm. we did see a report that the state income tax was higher than estimated in the current year. Uh, that report came with a lot of caveats about yeah. uh, that, that next month may see uh, more refunds than normal and that there are some other uh, challenges to the, uh, on the corporate income tax and some delays with reductions to the corporate income tax that we may see in the coming months. Um, but those changes would affect 2016-17. So to the extent that those do increase income taxes, that would also be seen at the city level. Uh, that will help us for 2016-17 in addressing that budget year. Uh, it, it, may, it may help offset some of the impact of that mid-decade census adjustment. Can I ask another uh, specific question? So the $2.2 million for police training, is that something that we would then pay pay next year as well or are they one-time trainings or or is it a mix mr manager you want to deal with the issue of police training in the budget yeah thank you mayor uh, councilman waring so it 
We would recommend that we need to continue that as a best practice to, to every year have 40 hours of training for our police officers. We had not been doing that, um, but certainly if, if we chose not to, it would be $2.2 million that we would not put into the 1617 budget. But I think the police chief and the assistant city manager would strongly urge me and all of us that we need to continue that program of training for our officers. And I'm, I'm not implying that we shouldn't sure. do it. It's just, I was just curious, do you take the training once and then you're good? Or you're saying it's an ongoing thing like lawyers or doctors would have? At this point, we would plan to build it into the budget as an ongoing expense but certainly it's something the council could review every year. Thank you. Other uh, comments or questions? Councilman Cecil, any questions, uh, comments? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a few questions here, if I could. Um, what I think what I'm seeing here, and I think that the public is seeing here, is that pension costs, retirement costs are taking more and more and more of the, big, of the budget, a bigger slice of the pie. And when people look at their services and say, well, why can't you fund that? I think all you have to do is look at the, the total retirement costs that are coming in, and they're going to get a good <laughs> dose of reality when they start to see how much is really being paid out in that. I mean, if you look at just the numbers that you put out, Mario, I totaled just total retirement costs just for this year an additional $9.7 million. That's everything in there from, well, that's the health care part without including the health care, I guess that would be that. I included that in that number. I just realized that small error. But in any respect, uh, the retirement costs are what are becoming the problem. Uh, our total retirement costs, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, throughout the city uh, is right around $319, $320 million. Is that about right? Do you have those numbers with you, Mario? I, uh, I don't have, I'm just going from memory. I, I don't have it with me. But I, I, I believe that includes uh, deferred compensation uh, as well as all of the other pension costs. Um, deferred compensation is a, a form of compensation, but when you add that to the total pension costs uh, and other um, post-employment benefits, it does total citywide over $300 million. And I think that's the number we need. I mean, it's interesting because we always come out and throw one or two numbers out there, but you know, as administrators, and as you know, elected officials up here, we need to see what the full amount is. And I know you pass that out to everybody, but I want to drive this home: is that that cost, literally just a few years ago, was around 270 million, and that that escalator is taking money away from other vital services. We have more money this year than we've had last year in revenue. What was our revenue last year, and then what's our revenue this year? What was it in? Uh, 14, 15, and then what is it uh, this year? Total revenue. Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, I, I actually don't have a total citywide number. I, what I have handy is our general fund okay. revenue. Um, Let's look at that then, since we, that's what we're talking about today. If we if we did look at the total revenue citywide, I, I don't think that would be the case. There are other, there are other pieces like property tax, uh, that when we when we actually total that has gone down considerably from what it was just a few years ago, but in the general fund, um, the 1314 revenue, uh, which was last fiscal year, was a billion twenty six million, um, and then and for this year in 1415 we're expecting a billion fifty million. Okay, so we're still seeing more revenue come into the city. It's just not at the same growth rate. And that takes away the million, uh, the billion fifty also includes um, the sales tax from the food tax being gone over what over a two month period. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So even with the food tax going away, we still have more revenue coming in. And the uh, I want to look at the what caused the $1.3 million increase in the pensions because I thought that was all fixed, but what caused that $1.3 million increase in the civilian pensions? With, with the civilian pension system, uh, that was we did expect to see continued increases as the unfunded liability is paid off for, for, civilian, for the COPER system. Uh, however, what we're seeing is that's flattening off. As we look over the next few years, that's going to be flattening and actually coming back down in the next few years, which is very um, different from what we see with the public safety pension 
uh, which is going to be uh, significantly in increasing each year over the next several years. And what percent is the civilian pensions funded? The 56 percent? I believe that council, Mayor Councilman, the CCO, it is in the mid to high 50s. So 56 percent is probably in the ballpark. So, and that's at a higher inflator rate too of what, seven and a half percent when the economy has been growing, not at that level. But we, that's another debate. But the, the question I've got for you, if we had to pay our pensions like we're supposed to, be actuarially correct on it, at 80 percent, what would our true pension cost be? And the same thing's happening with public safety as well, because right now I believe that that's funded right around 39% at the city of Phoenix, 38, 39%. I don't. Yeah, I'm I just believe public safety pensions, Mayor Councilman of CC, I believe public safety pensions are in the high 40s, if I'm I, remembering correctly. I thought they were lower than that in the 30s, but we'll even if they're in the high 40s, that still means 60% is unfunded, which we don't, we're not paying. You know, you're, and by a general rule, you should be at the 80% level. And I believe that starting this year, GATT is going to require us to report what that unfunded amount is going to be and what that should show on these types of numbers. See, what, where I'm getting at is that the public really doesn't see the real crisis that's really brewing behind this. Because what the city of Phoenix does and what other governments do, it's not just Phoenix, they mask it and they hide it back over, and that's what the unfunded part is. And when they see the total number that's unfunded, I think that they're going to get some stock, uh, sticker shock on that. The savings from the, um, uh, the refinance of the Sheraton, how much is that going to be? Because you talked about savings through their, I assume that's what you're talking about, the, what the excise tax? Uh, Mayor, Councilman, the CCO, actually we, we have not uh, taken the Sheraton through a refinancing yet. But those numbers that we're talking about would not impact the general fund. The, the Sheraton is oh, a standalone credit and a, and a uh, standalone bond issuance. The refinancing we're talking there are, are about the um, excise tax debt that we issue for things like uh, large vehicles, our city facilities, and maybe some big technology purchases. And so that's the excise tax refinancing that was just recently completed. Oh, I thought finance. you were talking about the uh basically the non-general fund you know departments the enterprise departments when you were talking about the excise tax so you're talking about the excise tax related to the general fund mayor councilman oh, the cco okay. some of it is related to the general fund some is also related to perhaps so for example the convention center is an excise tax but it is largely general fund and it is not inclusive of the sheraton hotel could you get me what we expect to see a savings on the sheraton since that's been in the media quite a bit by the refinance, what we're expecting at least. Um, I believe it's going to be quite a bit. We can, It'll yes. be in savings. So at the end of the day, the shortfall for the pensions. Oh, one last question. I do want to get this on the record. At least I think I know the answer. But the amount of monies um, that you know, when we did this shift with the public safety pensions, what was that total expense supposed to be this year? About $36 million approximately? What was that amount? I don't understand the shift. Well, the delaying it out, basically oh, I paying apologize. it out. Mayor, Councilman, the CCO, you're referring to the uh, option that the public safety pension retirement system state uh, system gave us cities to either take the entire, uh, uh, basically the entire expense of the Supreme Court decision on the Fields case uh, in one year or to step into it over three years, and we chose this budget reflects stepping into it over three years. Um, Mario, which is, you have those numbers? Yes. Uh, so the 1516 public safety pension costs are estimated at $143 million with the phase in. If we, if we did not do the phase in, we would be looking at $177 million costs. Which is in fifteen sixteen, so about a, is that? about a thirty four million, million dollars. dollars. Thirty four million. Okay. And then what will be the additional cost by doing that? What is the total additional cost that's gonna be on that? Because you have an interest charge carryover. How much is that gonna be? So, so I'm about to trying to remember top of my Mayor, head. Mayor um, Councilman to CCO. So the uh, the upfront the savings to us are about fifty million dollars in these first three years. 
over the back end over the last 20 years, it's the net cost to us, I think, is around. 69 million is the number, I believe it was, over a 22-year period. So it ends up being about a $2.5 million per year on the back end in, uh, extra that we're paying in. Well, but it's like a mortgage. I mean, the, the longer you string it out, you could save money at the beginning, but the longer your mortgage, the longer your debt, the more you're gonna pay long-term in debt. And Councilman Waring brought this up before, and I know this will create a little bit of controversy, but I wanna make sure that the public understands exactly what this is. It is literally taking debt and placing it on more debt. And that is a function of a government that is not fully in control. When you do those types of things, you get into trouble. And so what they're doing, the best way I can describe it is using a credit card to pay long-term debt. And these are debts that you have to pay. It is what it is. And what it does is it not only puts, I think, the future of the city in jeopardy, that's at least my position on this, is that it also puts the police officers in jeopardy by not paying that because I don't think that it makes them more secure in knowing that their pensions are gonna be paid. It just creates, I think, as you pile more and more and more debt on, it makes things a lot less secure, you know, whether it's in our households or whether it's in government, but you'll also start to see the impact of this. And these pension costs have gotta get under control. The model that the, some up here are pushing doesn't do that. It doesn't do anything to fix anything. Uh, what it does is it literally continues to put band-aids on a problem that needs strong structural fix and things that by, by making the right decisions in place of just, you know, one, I advocate, especially when it comes to the public safety part, just paying those pensions, pay them. Pay them up front, it reduces your costs long term and you'd be much better off by doing that. But that's a, a political decision that has to be made here. But what we are seeing is more and more services are gonna be impacted by these rising retirement costs, not just pension costs, total retirement costs. That is where the problems lie. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, if I might just put a finer point on it. First of all, um, Please be assured I would not recommend a budget that I believe puts the city in any sort of long-term jeopardy. I, th I think that the budget being proposed here is responsible. And, and the issue you raise is one that, of dis that is discussion, but the pension is a long-term obligation and we are paying what the state says we need to pay for our long-term obligation on the public safety side. Can, could we pay more up front? Yes, we could. The issue there is the balance between the immediate services that we need to provide, including police officers and firefighters, and a long-term uh, issue. So it's sort of, it is like a mortgage in that you have to balance how much do you wanna pay the debt on your home immediately versus what you pay over a longer period of time because the, the, uh, the pension liability is a long-term liability. Um, I think it, it does illustrate the wisdom of the council in continuing to do pension reform on the civilian side because we've seen those costs start to flatten, those costs increase start to flatten, and it points to the necessity of a longer term statewide solution to the public safety pension, which members of the council have advocated for. Um, so I'm very comfortable in recommending this, understanding that it is a choice about um, future expenses but uh, I, I'm comfortable in the recommendation. Councilman, did you wish to respond to the city manager? No, I mean, we could get into a long discussion over that, whether or not you should have a 20-year mortgage or a 30-year or a 55-year mortgage. You know what I mean? That's really, it's that level of reasonableness of how far you should be able to extend these things out and keep pushing it down. As you push the problem further down, it just gets bigger. And I think that there should be some decisions made to fix this thing and fix it now before my kids have to get stuck paying this bill. City manager responded, Councilman. Councilman Warren. Thank you. Um, I guess my concern with the issue that Councilman DeCicio raised is that, you know, next year we're, we're projecting deficits. How big, who knows? I think 40 million on the low side, generally. Um, if we did bite the bullet that, that he's talking about this year, it wouldn't be pleasant. But we may have to make those same decisions 
next year we could sort of get i guess a one-year jump on the on it by doing it now we are pushing it down the road how far we can talk about that today um i would ask you a question that i've asked you before you know is healthcare a bigger healthcare costs most businesses i think would say healthcare costs are a bigger problem than than pension or retirement costs for us i think you've told me or check me if i'm wrong the pension costs are a bigger issue but you are addressing the healthcare costs which i'm i'm pleased about i don't remember so many meetings i think we've you've only briefed the subcommittee is that correct we have not brought it to the full That's council correct. so um so for without getting into the details of it so for next year the budget is saving $5 million on the retirees portion of our health care bill. Is that correct? Mayor uh, Councilman Waring, yes. Through the work that's going to be done by the Health Care Benefits Trust and the retirees, we believe that some changes to retiree health care could accrue savings in the neighborhood of $5 million to the, to the city. And that's reflected in your numbers here? It it's is not. not. So that would be $5 million in new dollars, potentially. That would be money that would be uh, for sixteen seventeen. For sixteen seventeen, yes, right? Sir. Sorry. Um, uh, and then you're working with the labor unions and employ current employees and so forth. And you think the potential savings is another fifteen million dollars, roughly? Is that a fair statement? Depending on how um, how we structure health care uh, benefits, there could be savings of fifteen million dollars. Uh, perhaps for 1617, but certainly for 1718. And that, that included, I forget, the, the uh, prescription drug costs that included, that 15 million is included in that, correct? Mayor, uh, Councilman Waring, yes. That's so potentially could be looking at $20 million in savings that could help offset a deficit for next year. For 1617, correct. They certainly deserve kudos uh, for, for finding a potentially innovative, or at least potential solution, um, or partial solution, I guess, to our, our budget problems with that. So that that's that's moving in the right direction that a lot of other businesses and cities and government entities and so forth aren't seeing. So certainly deserve. I don't like to always be negative, Ed. So I'll say just I, I think that that's a good thing, and I appreciate that. Um, one thing you did mention earlier on the pension side was action at the state. We had talked about having a a meeting to get briefed on kind of what's been discussed at the state. It's a little bit out of our hands, but I think some of us expressed an interest in not just saying it's the state's problem. We'd like to be more active participants, whether we agree that the current proposals are exactly what we want. Are we in the process of setting up those meetings? Because I, I think that came up at one of the council meetings a while back. I know they were in session and we've had other meetings and so forth, but. Mayor, Vice Mayor, or Councilman Waring, yes, we, uh, there are several proposals being worked on at, at the moment. I know that uh, the firefighters, State Firefighters Association has a proposal. The League of Arizona Cities and Towns has a, has a working group putting some ideas together. I don't believe that at least the League of Cities and Towns idea is fully fleshed out yet, um, but certainly we can arrange to have a, a full conversation as you wish on public safety pension and what the issues are. There's there's time because it really will be a solution that has to be enacted in the next general session, which would start in January of 16. I, I haven't heard right. that there would be a special session, so I think everyone's pointing towards a January of 16 session. So certainly the fall of this year would be good time for us to have enough information to provide that briefing. I mean, I've talked to people who are involved in those discussions, but obviously I'd like to have, you know, for those who haven't had those discussions too, but certainly fresher information. Um, I'd be curious to hear that, but I'd also like staff's interpretation of how much money we're talking about potentially saving, and so forth. So to the extent you could get with the people proposing these things in advance, obviously I'm interested in the issue. We're, we're all just interested as Arizonans in the issue, but I think those of us up here, we're certainly interested in how does this affect us? So if there, if there could be sort of a two pronged approach there, you know, to, clock is definitely ticking. So I, I'd certainly be interested in that. Thank you. I thank you very much. My understanding is that Representative Debbie Lesko is uh, trying to bring together the various parties Councilman, are you at? Are you suggesting that we have Representative Lesko up here before this? We can yeah, certainly have. Whatever you guys think is the best. But you know more about that than uh, many uh, many of us here uh, in terms of uh, where, whoever we identify as the best. I don't know that it's necessary for me to make the invitation, but I guess I can if if uh, if you think it's appropriate. But in any case, I guess I, I guess our lobbyists would know who are the stakeholders who are participating. 
who don't work for us. Uh, Mayor, Count, Councilman Waring, staff can certainly work with our intergovernmental team and identify the best people to present the different alternatives out there, yes. I think we've indicated we were going to have um, representatives from the uh, Arizona Police Association and the state firefighters to talk about their, at least the, the ideas that they're presenting to this committee, which I think is the best uh, vehicle, and I think they're going to come uh, before us. But if, if you, I mean, if you, if you um, would like to talk to Represent Lesko and see if she's interested in coming, I don't know if she wants to air it in this format or not, if she's trying to bring the parties together, but, uh, but certainly in terms of the APA and the uh, state firefighters, at least come before this body indicating what proposals they're going to be making uh, to try to enact in a state law. I think that would be a very positive, um, uh, positive thing. Other questions uh, or comments? I, I just I feel it's fair uh, in light of some of the statements made by uh, uh, Council Waring that uh, you know the city manager, of course, is looking ahead at our all of our support about next year's uh, budget. Some of the items that were alluded to have not been adopted by the city council. They will be very obviously they'll be appropriately agendized, and we'll have a significant debate uh, discussion on this council and make that recommendation ultimately be our decision. This this body's decision about whether or enact any changes in. Uh, the city's health care uh, policies that may result in savings that that'll come before this um, uh, come for this body so those decisions have been made yet but obviously the city manager is working on um, some ideas about um, uh, potential cost savings well, I guess we'll say we did have a very extensive though briefing about this in subcommittee so I mean we have had a public meeting about I thought it was pretty detailed I just want to assume yeah. it was a done deal I apologize oh, yeah. yeah it has to come yeah. before this council uh, Correct, Mayor. as I mean, it should be secret. It wasn't, uh, I don't think any, there are no secrets. I think, uh, Councilman Gates. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think that the system, you know, worked again, the, the way that it's supposed to work, where uh, the city manager put together a trial budget, and then we had the opportunity to go out and hear from our constituents and get input. And I thought it was actually a, a great um, summary of some of the issues that were raised by the constituents, so so I, I appreciate that. Um, one of the issues that came up uh, that that we heard testimony from was the Humane Society. I think is very enlightening of the assistance that the Humane Society has provided, uh, really to the city, to our residents for years of helping and public safety calls and taking the injured or abused animals and and helping them really at the Humane Society's complete cost. And so although there's not money in the revised budget, I'm pleased to see that it's uh, going, there's gonna be a real focus on this moving forward because clearly if the Humane Society d decided not to provide this service any longer, that would be a huge cost upon the city and upon uh, the uh, um, uh, public safety. So, so thank you for that. I'm pleased to see that. Also pleased to see um, the school zone signs. Again, that's something we heard about out there at the at the meetings, at the budget hearings. Having that added back into the budget, and yet that's at no additional cost because you were able to come up with efficiencies. I think that's a very important uh, service that the city provides to our school districts. Again, we don't run the school districts as a city, but there are ways like this we are we are helpful uh, to our schools and, and and helpful to public safety as well good uh, discussion about the health care issues we did have a great uh, presentation in subcommittee I look forward to um, that issue coming to the full council I also look forward to our partners in health care being motivated by these discussions to see what they can do to bring down health care costs and work with us and work with our employees in a positive way to bring those costs down because I think there are real savings available if everyone is, is willing to pitch in. So I think that's going to make a difference. I also um, want to thank uh, Ed Zerker for working with some of the other um, municipalities in the Valley on this census issue. That's a real issue out there, real concerns. We need to be careful and protect our interests, but also sort of balance, also balancing some of the investments that have been made by other again municipalities on this so uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that you're on top of that and finally i i'm encouraged by what i'm hearing and i think it's good to get a full briefing um, from uh, the hearings and the meetings that debbie lesko has been holding with a lot of the 
the um, uh, stakeholders coming to the table. We need to, everyone needs to come together on this issue, and, and I thank her for her leadership so far, and I think uh, we, we need to be literally as, as involved as, as we can, as we're wanted uh, to, to be involved in that moving forward. Uh, so good presentation, and look forward to further uh, discussion over the next couple of uh, weeks uh, before this comes back to the council. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Any other comments by members of the council? Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Oh, I'll get you, Councilman William Gallego, just a moment. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I do want to compliment you. I think you've done a good job. I think that uh, uh, we started early. Uh, you identified savings. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, you found savings. Uh, we cut positions, and I thank you and Mario and all of the department heads and staff that worked very diligently. Uh, continuing to work very diligently to continue to find more savings in the future. I am very concerned about the pension, public safety pension. I think Ed, you and I had that discussion earlier today uh, that we need to uh, work very closely with the other cities as well as the state. Hearing Debbie uh, Lisko is already working on this. I hope that uh, you assign someone to immediately get involved uh, because it is extremely important to all of us uh, not just the firefighters and the police officers, but the taxpayers as well. It's a two-way street on this one. And I think it's it's something that they recognize. Uh, Brian Jeffries has been leading the way. Uh, to me, uh, I think that we need to step out there. Uh, I, if it's not perfect, but we don't see other solutions, I think we should perhaps take a risk and go for it as best we can to make the reforms necessary, but I would leave that up to the committee because I suspect they will have uh, expertise there that will get us where we need to go. Um, I also uh, have been um, not informed about any of the health care, and I would appreciate it if you could uh, forward to my office a copy of your presentation as well as the minutes from the meeting. Uh, because I have no knowledge of what you're talking about, and I think that sounds extremely important that everybody on the council fully has uh, prior knowledge before we have that conversation in public. And then the Humane Society. I am um, concerned that um, they have provided a free service to us for a very long time. Uh, we have increased the officers that are handling animal abuse cases. It is supported by the community, and I am concerned uh, how long they can go without any type of payment. Um, so I know that you said you will study it over summer, but I would like to mention some things I'd like to have some data on. Uh, I would like to know how many uh, cases and animals have been forwarded and the Humane Society have participated in in the last year. I want to know the average length of stay of the animals at, the, at their facility. I want to know how many of the animals were immediately signed over uh, for adoption and how many had to be retained uh, as live evidence, and if so, for what length of time. I would like to know how much um, the medical expenses were to nurse many of these animals back to health. And if they're there long term, any continuing care where they have to have a they're not, we know the cats were there two years. They had to have inoculations and continued care. Uh, hopefully we don't have 60 dogs down there in that same position, but if so, I would like to know the total amount of care. And then I would like to know uh, how many court cases have been filed and uh, what have been the results of those court cases where the animals uh, signed over to, uh, I suppose, Humane Society for Adoption, uh, return to the owner, or what was the outcome? I, w I would like to have some more information. Once we have that data and that information, if we are fortunate to be like the state and um, there has been an increase, is there any way that we could have a budget review and at least um, consider giving them some funding this fall or mid-year? I would like to have a review because uh, it's one thing if people are getting money and we're giving them an increase. It's another thing when they're getting zero and we expect a service from them. 
Um, I know how we would feel about it with our budget, and I know that they're in a similar position with their budget. They have to rely on donors and volunteers. Um, they provide a service just like the city. So I think it's extremely important that, that you look into this. Mayor Thank Councilman you, Mayor. Williams, yes, it is possible for the council to make mid-year adjustments, as you suggested, should the council choose to do that. All right, other uh, comments or questions for members of this uh, council? Councilman Pesto, oh, excuse me, uh, Councilman Gallego, did you have something? I know you, I don't know if you had to lead the meeting. Is she still there? Uh, yes. Uh, Please, go ahead. Yes. I Can you hear me? Go ahead, yes. Wonderful. I just, as we discuss pension reform, I think it's very important that we remember this um, expenditure is the result of a lawsuit where the Supreme Court decision means we have an, an unplanned expenditure. And so it's not that we're ignoring the expenditure, we are phasing it in because it was the result of a lawsuit, so an attempt to make a successful pension reform that did not go through. So I think it is responsible to phase it in since it was not something that has been in the budget for many years. And I, um, I'm also glad we're moving forward on health care and would like some of the info additional information uh, my colleagues requested. I am sorry that this year's budget does not include an air quality position at a senior level that we eliminated last year. Air quality continues to be very important in district eight and so that's something that i would like to see as we move forward and then in looking at the humane society um, and their request to me i think the place we should begin first is looking at animals that are kept as part of evidence in a case in our court system so that seems like a good first step forward in working with the humane society if we do a mid-decade or mid-year uh, review and then I was wondering if staff could tell us if Proposition 104 passes, how much additional arts funding that would represent. The question I do with arts funding and Proposition 104, and so I think uh, the city manager has a, uh, what can only be described as a quizzical look on his face. Uh, Councilman, you should describe Proposition 104 in a little more detail. Um, the transportation ballot initiative, would, would I understand, include 1% for the arts? Okay, the transportation initiative and then uh, the um, per percent for the arts program, the element there, there from. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. City Manager. Uh, so we would like to see additional arts funding, and that seems like the biggest potential source. Mayor Councilman Gallego, yes, to the extent that there is capital funding in uh, in there, the percent for the arts ordinance would apply. We will get a specific number that has been estimated from our transit and street staff and get that back to the council before the decision on the 19th. Thank you. Anything else, Councilwoman? That is it. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Pastor. I just, um, I appreciate that we balance the budget and I thank everybody that put their efforts into it. Um, <clears throat> but I'm already on uh, 2016 2017 and I would like to know uh, I would like to see uh, communities come together to come up with solutions on if we're going to cut where we're going to cut and how we're going to cut or what public private partnerships we start to build in order for uh, next year's 2016 2017 budget uh, is that Possible or what point would we we look at the calendar and start that conversation and I would like it to start it sooner before Sooner than later. Mayor, Councilman Pastor, certainly when we get to a point where we have an identified uh, number that we could, we'd feel confident about, that would be the time, I guess with you, that would be with, uh, late fall of, of 2015. And so we would uh, be happy to talk about a strategy to in, include the community in ways to think about solutions to that okay. at that point. And then there was a, at one point last year, we were receiving monthly budget um, information, um, and I haven't received that for a while now. So can we go back to receiving that uh, once a month? Uh, it was a documentation that uh, demonstrated healthy, unhealthy, water, look at this, look at that. Um, so is that possible to go back to, to that? Yeah, Mayor, uh, Councilman Pastor, that's actually a re monthly report that's uh, presented by our auditor and chief financial officer together. It, it should be on our website, and we'll make sure that that is happening and that that's accessible to everyone. Thank you very much. Any additional comments by members of the council? Councilman Alkowski, and just know we have a couple of uh, cards from members of the public as well. Councilman. 
Well, first of all, I just want to thank our staff for all their hard work and attending all the public um, meetings. And I just want to thank you for taking their input. A couple of things I heard out there is that Humane Society that we're going to we're going to continue studying that, and you're going to bring that back to us to tell us what your results are. The other thing I was hoping for is that if we can look at even the park rangers and maybe do a study on that, because every time we have to call a police officer out to a park just for a violation or that the music's too loud or whatever, I mean, I'd rather have police officers going after individuals that are creating crimes, not dealing with little disputes over um, the radio being too loud and stuff like that. So if we can look at maybe even savings of police calls to parks and um, our reserves and what kind of cost savings we'd have with the um, park rangers seeing that now that we have the over sh uh, floor shelter being closed we've been receiving a lot of calls that we have individuals in alleys um, that are camping out and sleeping and um, doing other things so those um, individuals are actually starting to spread out into the neighborhoods and we're getting a lot of calls and i know that our parks are the are a fine target for individuals to to spend the night and, and to hang out. So I believe that park rangers are a good way of deterring that. The other thing is um, I'd, like to th I'd like to thank our staff about the um, looking at the libraries and having two of our libraries, the South Mountain and our um, Burton Bar Library open seven days a week. I think that's a, a, a great option for individuals. I know that we had a lot of advocates I'm asking for seven day, um, if we can have our parks, our libraries open for seven days, but now having two of our libraries open seven days a week um, really helps those individuals that don't have computers or access to the internet, they can actually use our library. So I'd like to thank you all for, for thinking outside the box and, and creating at least two locations where we can actually have that. And with that, um, just once again, just if you can look into that study for the park rangers, and the uh, Humane Society, I mean, we have a problem in my district, especially around the river bottom, where we have abandoned animals. And it really, um, if it wasn't for the Humane Society going out there and helping us with that situation, we would have a, a really bad problem. So I, there's abuse of animals going on out there, and it's really these individuals that volunteer and help out. And there's a need for, um, uh, for, for more help and resources to the Humane Society, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a quick uh, council, Vice Mayor, do you have something? I apologize, go, please jump in. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Zerker, great job. Mario, uh, Milton, your, your entire team, uh, a great job. And there's a couple of things I just want to remind our viewers and our constituents. Uh, you know, look, we, are, we, have some, we have some issues. I guess that I don't really have to uh, remind everyone of that. I, I do want to just make a couple of comments here. We are balancing this budget. And last year, the forecast showed us coming in at a 30, about a $34 million deficit. That was the forecast. And we are balancing this budget. And a lot of it has to do with the core program that Milton led at Ed's direction. Uh, frankly, if you are a city employee, thank you. Uh, because a lot of it had to do with the concessions that, that were made. That was a two-year concession. Uh, you know, we... we uh, we swept many positions, a total of 180, 162 out of the, the general fund. Uh, we made some very tough decisions to, to get to where we had to, to, to go. I mean, just today I used a, a parking meter to get to a meeting in downtown Phoenix. I paid a little extra for that parking meter. I know it was a very uh, contentious issue. I'm glad that I was able to do it with the credit card, by the way, as opposed to, to change. But Nonetheless, dealing with issues like that, our seniors having to pay more, okay? But those were yes votes for the majority of the council anyway. Very tough decisions that had to be made that got us into an era, a, this situation where we are now balancing this budget when we were facing a pretty big deficit a year ago. So that is a world-class city. That is not a city uh, headed in the wrong direction. Does that mean that we are home free? No, of course not. We, we still have some challenges ahead of us. Next year, we're facing, it looks like we're facing a deficit. Uh, we're gonna continue down the path with, with the core. We're gonna continue to, to be fiscally responsible. In fact, this proposed budget shows some of that responsibility, $314,000 we place in reserve 
for our known public safety pension increases. Uh, you know, we could do something else with that money. There's a lot of things that we'd like to do, but I think that's the responsible thing to do. Uh, it's also important to, to remember that it's been a long time, you know, since we were able to, to put in a budget the hire of 110 police officers, like this budget calls for. 90, more than 90 firefighters, like this budget calls for. Uh, con completing the work for the Northwest Light Rail Extension of Light Rail, 1,500 jobs, that'll be complete. It'll connect 20,000 people to opportunity around Light Rail. Not to mention all of the economic development opportunities that will be housing opportunities, business opportunities that will be that will be aligning along light rail just like it has for most of the first 20 mile stretch that we see right here in the valley. So great job to our uh, city staff, great job, frankly, to my colleagues on the council, to every city employee. Thank you so much for, uh, for not only coming to work and, and doing a great job every single day, but for also uh, you know, I mean, that, that's a tough deal uh, to just to, to help taking that sacrifice when we had to do the, the concessions, and we shouldn't forget that uh, either. Now, I also just want to mention one more thing about the pensions, because when we talk about that topic, for some people who may not watch the council meetings every week or, you know, uh, take a look at all the minutes of each meeting, it's, it, it can be pretty complicated. So when we hear pensions, we have to remind, and, and by the way, this was in the budget hearing presentation, and I really appreciate this. Uh, there is the COPERS system, which is our city employees, and there's the, the public safety system. We led an effort in 2013, you may remember, uh, March of 2013, uh, it was on the ballot, it was pension reform, responsible pension reform, that we still have to go back and continue to monitor and make changes when, when uh, you know, when appropriate. But that that pension reform passed with more than 80 percent, or roughly 80 percent, of the vote. It passed. Had that not passed, that deficit that we had to deal with last year would have been five million dollars deeper. Because it did pass, we are going to realize savings of, of, you know, between that pension reform and a couple of other measures, we're going to realize savings of about $800 million over the course of 23 years. That is what's taken place. That's responsible governing. That's what we have, have uh, been able to do right here at the City of Phoenix. The, the public safety pension costs that are being discussed in this particular meeting and we're talking about a cost that this council does not have a vote in. That is at the state. And so I do appreciate the conversation of, you know, why not con communicating with some of our state representatives, those who do have a vote. And let's have that conversation, let's figure out what those plans are, are because, you know, regardless of when that happens, we are on the hook. That is a, that is a, uh, you know, that is, a bill, essentially, we have, we have to be, uh, we are responsible for that. So we have to continue to, to, to push for that conversation to be had uh, at the state uh, as, you know, and I'm, I think we can all be proud to say that the city of Phoenix is, we can, you know, we're, we led by example and we're asking the state to take a look at that. I do commend our good friends, uh, Brian Jeffries, the president of the Professional Firefighters of Arizona. Um, as well as Levi Bolton, the president of the Arizona Police Association, who's helping to lead that effort as well. And, um, and, and hopefully something responsible will be done soon, which will uh, bring some relief when it comes to the public safety pension system. But, you know, for what we have the purview to, uh, you know, we have the purview over uh, the, the COPER system, and uh, there's been some changes to that. So as time moves on, we'll realize more savings. We're headed in the right direction there. Um, I mentioned the, the 110 police officers, more than 90 firefighters, completing the Northwest Light Rail Extension, and there are so many other things that I appreciate about this particular budget. I want to point out the public's, that, you know, obviously public safety must remain our number one priority, and we are allocating $2.2 .2 million 
to a new training module uh, on community and cultural consciousness. And we, you know, we are world class. We have a world class police department. This will uh, keep us in that category of being world class. And, and Mrs. Zerker, I appreciate your comments on this type of training being ongoing. We should constantly look and evolve. Our, our community is becoming more and more diverse. Uh, District 5 is home to Alhambra High School, the most diverse high school in the state. More than 40 languages spoken in this high school, and that is a precursor. Uh, you know, these are bright young minds who live in Phoenix, who want to raise their families in Phoenix, who wish to you know, open businesses in Phoenix. Many of them have these entrepreneurial minds. We want them here, and, uh, and we want to, to be sure that they also feel safe. And, uh, you know, it's important to give our uh, police officers who are doing a good job, it's important to get them the tools that they need uh, to, to do just that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple cards uh, from the public. Uh, I, uh, okay, I'll, I'll come back to you. Oh, okay. you. Um, Council Warren as well. Um, can you go back to the, to the slide relative to the community requests uh, for the reposed uh, budget? Um, my only thought is that I just I, I don't think that this particular slide does justice to the uh, members of the community that came before the, the, the council. For example, uh, the library advocates, obviously their ultimate goal is to get daily access in the libraries. Um, the, the people that have communicated with my office, are, they're very sophisticated when it comes to their advocacy. I don't think they're actually advocating $2.4 million in one budget. I think that they want us to set a goal to get to that point and to work our way up to that amount. The arts community that I work so very closely with, they're not asking for $900,000 in this budget. So I, I just think this slide does a disfavor to the community leaders that advocate in these areas because they're, they're not asking for it all in, in year one. So at least, I think this leaves a false impression. If you agree with that, Mr. City Manager, I politely request that maybe we use a different slide to rep to, because I think this leaves the impression that they are less than sophisticated when it comes to the City of Phoenix budget process, and that many of them are very, very sophisticated. So that is my polite request uh, moving forward. I don't think it's uh, fair to the um, leaders in the community that this leaves, a, leaves a, uh, an unfair impression with the, uh, with the public. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Waring, then we'll go to, to cards. Uh, can I ask a question about what the mayor just, just asked about, about the, well, he just took it off, the, the 2.4 million for the libraries. So is that, so if a library is open five or six days a week, is that filling in an eight hour day? Because this has come up in my district too. Um, I know it's hard to fill if it's a Sunday. Um, it's been explained to me it's hard to get people to come in for half a day. But what, what does that $2.4 million figure represent? That's filling in all the rest of the days with a full eight hour day? Sure. Seven Mayor, days a week. Yeah, yeah. Mayor, Councilman Waring, first of all, I go back. Mayor, we certainly did not want to imply that any of these people said that they needed to have that right now or right away. I appreciate the, the comment that I think you it, made. I think it we may do, have that false leave impression. That. Yeah. yeah, it was really more to put a context around what those things would cost were they to be ultimately there. So understood, and we will we will revise that. In terms of the libraries, I believe Mario, you uh, you had detailed that out as a, as a half day on Sundays. But I'll let, ask Mario if he'll explain the the rationale of that. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Ed. So. The, for, the, for those that are open only five days a week right now, it would add a Sunday for four hours. And so that, that would be that sixth day for those libraries. And then the additional, uh, the, the additional, if we were to go to the seven days for all of the libraries, it would add another eight hour day for, for the 15 libraries. So, so, so it'd be a total of 12 hours. And then and it'd be a total of 12 hours for those libraries that are only open five days. But there are some libraries that are currently open six days. It would be four hours because those libraries are closed on Sundays that are open six days. Well, I'm sorry. So the 2.4 million is the entire figure hey. to open yeah. every library for at least what we consider a full day, recognizing that Sunday is a four hour. That's day. correct. Is that, is that a way to phrase it? Okay. Because um, it, it just seems it just seems a little high to me, um, and it just seems like there are ways we could shave hours one area and make it 
you know, if somebody's working a six six day week and they want to go to the library on their day off, it, it is unfortunate if the library, it's a big believer in libraries, if the library isn't open that day, they happen to have the day off. So it just seems like, because I, I, I've asked this question before, um, more specific to my district, but just in general, it just seems like there'd be a better way to work around this, not have that 2.4 million figure, which I think is to the mayor's point, you know, they, they weren't asking for all that at once, but they were asking to get at least some hours every day. And it just seemed to me, the answer I got back, I understand if it's a partial day, it's hard to get a full-time person to come in then two fours during the week or something, but it just seems like there should be a way around that. So maybe if you could delve into that a little bit. Yeah, deeper. I think we can abs absolutely come back to the appropriate subcommittee and explore the details of how the library would, would view different blocks of time that add up to that, to the mayor's point of, getting there over time, which certainly these folks all understand the incremental nature of, of moving towards that. I mean, if it's open, it doesn't have to necessarily be open, to my mind, at least eight hours a day. It's just some hours each day mm -hmm. would, would be helpful. Uh, back to the point, though, is something uh, Councilman Gallego mentioned. So the pension costs are inflated for this year by, was it $36 million because of the lawsuit? That sort of ballpark. The, the Fields total, decision, what was the fiscal impact on the city from the uh, Fields uh, decision? The, the total amount that we were looking at was a, was a difference of $34 million from whether we phase it in or not. That does include some amount that would have increased anyway without the Fields decision, but most of that is a result of the Fields decision. So $34 million of unexpected or, or one, their one-time costs. Is that, is that a fair statement? Some of them are one-time costs, which would be the payments going backwards other of it represents the increase in liability going forward so it's a mix of that and I don't know that we know exactly what the mix is Mario do you well have that was gonna be my that? question so you you don't know what the mix is exactly of no we don't know exactly versus. what the mix is and a, a lot of those costs would continue at that level so it's not as though that 34 million would be only in that year and then the cost would come back down we would continue to see the public safety pension costs go up even with the full immediate payment of the fields decision I mean, I understand the costs are going up, but you're saying of that specific 34 million that we are, I know you guys don't like the word borrowing, but that we're, we're, so we're planning on making to deal with that 34 million, two and a half million dollar a year payments for was it 22 years? 22 years that, is the 22 total years at two and a half million dollars a year. But we'll still have escalating costs. Some of those costs out of the 34 million are still gonna escalate the next year. If we paid the 34 million this year, we'd still have increased costs from this particular ruling next year. Is that fair? And you, but you're saying yes. you don't know what those costs are. Well, what we, what we know is that if if we took the immediate costs in 15-16, we would see 177 million dollar cost for public safety pension, and then in 16-17, that cost would go up again by another 12 million dollars. With the phase in, however, what we're seeing is $143 million cost in, in 15 16. And then that goes up uh, to 170 million. Right, you're more gradually, you're kind so, of easing into so it. So, in both situations, the costs go up uh, even after uh, 15 16 and then 16 17. And then in 17 18 um, is when you would see a, a, a bit of a difference. Uh, with the three year phase in, the costs are a little bit higher. Um, in 1718, 195 million as compared to 191. But you are factoring in already increases in pension costs in your five year projections. So I guess I'll phrase it a different way. So, so next year, you're including these increases in pensions and you're projecting a roughly, what's the range at 40 million or Mario, 40 million to Next 65 million, something range. like that. It's a 1617 deficit range. Yeah, it's. Uh, between about 40 and 60. Okay, so this gets to Councilman Pastor's point because she talked about let's start looking at next year and I, I applaud her for, for mentioning or saying that. Um, I guess my point to Councilman DeCicio's point and, and sort of to Councilman Gallego's point about the one-time nature of this particular 34 million, is it a fair statement that if we paid the $34 million this year, we'd have to make cuts, it would be painful, but if we made the $34 million in cuts this year, we'd have a lot less to cut next year. To my mind, we're borrowing two and a half million a year for 22 years to put off pain we're gonna accept anyway for one year. 
Actually, no, that's not the case. Yeah, please, uh, yeah, please uh, explain. That's why I'm asking. So, the, the, this actually, tell me why I'm wrong. This assists. This helps the city over the next three years. It's a three-year phase, and so the costs are reduced over the next three years. Uh, 15, 16, uh, 16, 17, 17, 18, it's implemented. And so it actually does help us to take this three year phase in, in 16, 17 as well. So if we did it in, so if we did it the next three years, the 34 million this year, next year you're saying our deficit would go the 40 million plus, and then the year after that, whatever it is, plus is that right so what would the deficits be for the next two years after next year the, the deficit looks like for 16 17 uh, could be about 12 million dollars higher uh, if we took the immediate um, the costs all at once this year we would see an additional 12 million dollars higher in 16 17 as well over what we're currently projecting with the three-year phase but now you're backing out we would have taken 34 million in cuts this year. So our base budget going into the next year would be by definition smaller. I mean, we always base next year's budget on what we're doing this year. No, the, the, when we do the five-year forecast, we assume that the previous year was balanced and that, and moving forward. Right, we'd, we'd have to cut stuff. I'm not saying it would be fun, but right. we, would, we would be making reductions in our base budget. So next year, we would be starting at a much lower base. Um, actually, no, because we would we would have those costs simply moved over to the public safety pension. So it's not it's not like the overall costs would actually be down. They would just be in a different place in the budget, and and those costs would continue to move forward for but 16, we could 17 cut as well. Some other department, it wouldn't have to be public safety. So Certainly. what you're saying seems seems not true to me. It would be getting right to Councilman Pastor's point. Let's talk about what we're thinking about doing next year. Only I'd be saying, why aren't we talking about doing that this year? And I'm well, not sure I'm hearing an answer that. I'm that not makes sure I'm understanding you completely. But ultimately, what we're what we're looking at over the next three years is 52 million dollars of reduced public safety pension costs as a result of taking the three-year phase in. And then over the 22, uh, over the next 22 years, we will see some higher costs that average about about $3 million a year, um, but it's those $52 million uh, in savings over the next, uh, over by, it's actually over the next two years by implementing the three-year phase in. So it does affect both the current year, helping us balance the budget. It helps keep uh, the, bu the budget deficit that's projected for 16, 17 where it is. If we did not, if we do not phase in those costs now, we will see even, an even higher deficit in 16, 17. But we're adding deficits for 22 years. I mean, we're adding deficit spending for 22 years, and the cumulative effect of that is we're paying $69 million more. Was that right? Than we would be if we just paid more. it. This, if we just paid it over these three years. But it does give the opportunity for things like the reform that we're talking about to be implemented and make those changes. It also gives us the opportunity to do the um, things that will bring those costs down over the long haul like the quarterly prepayments that's, that we're implementing as a result of the chief financial officer's suggestion. That, that was not built into those estimates, but that will bring those costs down over that 22-year period, and it will help increase our, uh, uh, take care of our unfunded liability as well. And certainly we don't have control over what the state legislature votes on. I'm just, I hope we don't put all of our eggs on, they're gonna red rescue and save us. I mean, that could all collapse, or if they put something on the ballot, voters might not vote for it. Um, okay. Mayor, Councilman Waring, our five-year forecast doesn't assume any reform in the PSPRS, so any reform that happens will be a net positive to that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, as everyone up here knows, the Fields decision obviously was uh, based upon the um, pension reform that the state legislature passed. It did affect cost of living increases uh, for retirees, and they sued saying you can't impact uh, mem current members of the uh, pension. They were successful. As you know, we are facing a similar type challenge in the Pacholi lawsuit, this so-called snapshot lawsuit here at the, uh, at the city of Phoenix, in which is a very similar legal uh, uh, theory, and obviously we'll be monitoring that very closely because that could impact us uh, as, uh, as well, the issue of, um, of um, pension costs as it relates to existing uh, employees. 
All right, I'm going to hand it over to members of the or ask members of the public to provide testimony. Ms. Rogers, did you have testimony on this um, uh, on this item? You're marked opposed, and it, obviously it's not an action item, but I assume you're going to uh, speak. Uh, okay, we do public. We'll come back to, to the council. Followed by uh, Jessica Amen from uh, Amen from uh, the um, uh, Humane Society Recovering District Three employee, and then Don Russell. Councilman Gates didn't catch that. <laughs> Before I begin my comments, um, Mayor and Council and members in attendance, I'm Greta Rogers. I would like a, a question answered by Mr. Zerker, please. What is the shortfall projected for the end of this year? For the end of the current budget year? Yes. We don't have a shortfall estimate. you have no shortfall no ma'am okay thank you we are still in a state of economic stasis in this city and the state that means flat therefore we don't have elasticity we have money for essentials, period. And I don't care what anybody wants that isn't essential. It's not affordable. You run the city the way you run your household. If you don't have money, you stop spending on stuff that is not essential, period. The essentials are in the general fund, and I'm not counting on any state or federal money because that's a crapshoot. 12% to the general fund for city departments operation. 88% goes to salaries, benefits, health care, pensions, whatever. 12%, in other words, $12 of every $100 we take in is to operate the city. And the essentials are public safety, water services, safe delivery, which means treatment by federal standards that are required, there's no option, and safe disposal the same requirements. Streets. Our streets are in a dreadful, deteriorated, unsafe condition. This has happened over a period of negligence by the city in spending money elsewhere and not on infrastructure replacement, repair, and maintenance. Seven billion dollars over the next generation to put these streets in safe, traversable condition. And that includes sidewalks and curbs and signals, the whole nine yards. And planning for sewage and flood drainage. That takes about two billion of the seven. That leaves approximately five for streets. We have over 3,000 miles of streets. And most of them are neighborhood streets. The balance is arterials and collectors. And you know what that is, and so I'm not gonna define it. This is essential. It's not frosting on the cake. Public works. For citizens, that means picking up and safely disposing of the trash. That is essential for the safety of the city. In the parks department, we need to restore to full complement 
which was 80 in 788 and 08 pre-recession, 80. We are down plus 30. These are public safety officers at the preserves. They aren't decorations in olive green uniforms. They aren't there to tell you where the restroom is and the drinking fountain. This is an essential. Before you come back here on the 19th in two weeks, I want these things addressed effectively and responsibly by each and every one of you. You have no less obligation to the citizens of the city of Phoenix who are the city of Phoenix. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rogers, uh, Jessica Mend, and followed by Don Russell. Can you hear me? There we go. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, congratulations on a balanced budget. I certainly understand the challenges that you face and the decisions that you must make. I would like to thank those for your comments earlier. However, I am here, of course, today to ask that you respectfully reconsider um, the Arizona Humane Society's request for funding this fiscal year. We have enjoyed a 12-year working partnership with the City of Phoenix and uh, providing investigative services and care for pets that are held in protective custody. Um, as you can understand, as we examine our budget and our goals and challenges for the future with our goal of being one of the leading animal welfare communities um, in the country, we certainly have to um, look at a paid contract um, in an effort to continue our partnership and the level of service. Um, as a reminder, we, um, to this point, our donors have been supporting these services. Um, last fiscal year, we received over 5,000 calls for investigative services in the city of Phoenix. Um, that did result in about 9,000 visits, though, by our EAMTs. Um, if we compare this to the city of Tempe, we um, did 700 calls for them last year, so a significant um, difference. I would also like to point out our Chill Cats case that Councilwoman Williams referenced. Since December 4th of 2012, we have held over 40 cats in our care and custody while while the court case with the city of Phoenix has resumed. Um, we have been responsible for the care of these animals and incurred those costs. The defendant currently owes us about $2 million in restitution. However, um, it is not likely that we will see that funding. Um, another issue that I do want to point out is that we currently do have a contract with the city of Tempe, and we also have bids out with Glendale, Goodyear, and Gilbert as well, and we certainly want to be fair to all of our municipal partners um, by having paid contracts. Um, and lastly, I just want to highlight that the amount that we did request was really um, less than 50% of actually what the costs are to continue to provide these services. We certainly appreciate our partnership with the City of Phoenix and understand your financial challenges. So we do look forward to continuing to work with you guys to provide the best care for our pets in the community. Um, Councilwoman Williams, I did write down your question, so we will certainly get back to you on our portion of those. And then uh, please feel free if any of you have any questions and would like to follow up with this afterwards, I'd be more than happy. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your excellent testimony. Any questions? Mayor. Councilman Williams. I, I don't know if, I, if you have the right answer or, or if the city manager. When these cases go to court, do you present a bill and ask for restitution? And are the judges advised uh, if they're going through city court how important that is? Because that would certainly offset what the city of Phoenix needs to. Yeah, I apologize. I meant to mention Chris West. He is the manager of our EAMT services, so I might have him um, answer that question. I know we seek out restitution fees. I think we currently receive like 17% um, each year of what we actually are requested. Go ahead. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record. Good to see you. My name is Christopher West. I'm the field operations manager with Arizona Humane Society. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Williams, to answer your question, we do submit a request for restitution on criminal cases that are processed through the city court or superior court. On average, we're getting less than two cents on the dollar. Uh, in regards to the chill cats, as they're referred, 
Um, that is averaging $50 a day to maintain those animals every day for the last two, two years, three months, four months. Um, uh, another example would be the cockfight that we had two years ago in the city of Phoenix on Christmas Day, pulling staff in and pulling 135 birds off of a property. Uh, the restitution on that well exceeded $10,000 for one case. So it, it, it can get exorbitant. Uh, to answer one of your questions, Councilwoman, on average, if there is an animal seized and there is no hearing, it is a 10-day hold period minimum. If the animal is requested for a hearing, we're looking at 17 to 25 days minimum hold, even if we retain custody of the animal through the courts. Thank you very much. Council Williams, did you, did you answer your question? Yes. Excellent. All right, appreciate it very much. Thanks for coming down. Don Russell? Honorable Mayor and City Council, on September 8th, the City Manager violated AR 2.12 and gave away $258,000 to employees who stayed home because of the rain. What's even more costly is loss of confidence in a city manager who would reward the non-performance of employees rather than reward the employees who overcame the challenges and made it to work that day to man their posts. We're asking the city council and the mayor to please look at the, the case and make a public vote to overrule or to rescind the decision of the city manager. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm not sure that was on the, uh, the, the budget item, but I appreciate the information and, uh, and uh, appreciate the, um, uh, the testimony. All right, I'll turn it back over to the council. Any final comments or questions? Obviously, this is not for action here today. Our, well, our, our uh, final vote of the city council will be uh, two weeks from today. Councilman Pastor, do you have a question? Yes, I have comments. And I want to go back to the slide that uh, where it showed the libraries and uh, the arts. So the community uh, uh, input, uh, I guess, you know, the, that suggested the financial impact of those community requests, yeah. On the daily access at libraries, uh, is it possible to be creative with schedules so that the libraries are open and it doesn't necessarily increase staff time, it's just being creative with the schedule? And like at the community college, uh, we, we look at staff and we get creative on how to meet all our needs with the library, with whatever it is, programming, and look at where we can shift staff to different areas uh, or different times to, in order to serve our community. Mayor, uh, Councilman Pastor, yes, we can work with the city library and identify any options that might be uh, possible for increasing access at all libraries by just shifting existing resources. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the most efficient way to staff an individual library, but certainly that's what the city librarian's expertise is, and we would um, be happy to come back and have that conversation uh, okay. about that. Okay, yeah, because I'm just thinking an employee that works um, Monday through Friday uh, possibly then could be shifted if there's enough staff to be shifted maybe Tuesday through Saturday. I don't know, but flexing the schedule and, and, and designing it in a way where we could service the needs of the community. Um, the other piece is uh, the monthly street landscape service. Um, uh, last week, if I recall, we voted on something. Uh, we voted on landscaping service last week, uh, shifting uh, 21 employees to uh, transportation area and then uh, possibly having a savings there and adding four other managers is is that what is that part of that mayor councilman pastor the what you voted on last week moved our landscape service from emergency response to three times a year one of the things that the transportation subcommittee requested we sort of vet out through the, the budget process was different levels of service, and one of the highest levels of service there would be to move to monthly street landscape from the three times yearly, and that would be the incremental difference between 
what you voted on last week and that higher level of service if we were to go from three times a year to 12 times a year? Of, of street landscape. Correct. You okay. went from the current three times a year, which you just voted on last week, because you're correct, to 12 times a year, the difference to the budget would be two and a half million dollars. With additional expense. Let me see. With 42 employees, we would then have to add more employees from a monthly. Am I, is that what I'm hearing? I believe these would be additional costs to the contracts. Okay. Can we look at that? I mean, can we, um, maybe it's not 12, maybe it's six, but can we see what we can work with within that contract and with that budgeting? Well, I think what this is saying is if you want to do anything beyond the three times, what this would suggest is, this is, saying, this is saying if you went to the full 12 times, anything above the three times a year would be an additional cost, and okay. there's no money identified for the additional cost unless we wanted to do something else to the budget in order to do that. So something else would have to be cut okay. in order to do that. So then here goes my uh, follow-up question to that is the 21 employees that are currently employed, were they only, since there's only 21 and we're now adding 42, those 21 employees, did they even do uh, three times a year landscaping? They did not, Mayor Council, Councilman Pastor, no, they did not. Those 21 employees in parks were able to respond on an emergency basis to okay. calls for service by, uh, by moving them to other jobs in the Parks Department and using that amount of money that was paying for that, we can get a contract service that can give us three times a year service. Oh, okay, got it. Are there any other uh, questions from members of the council? The only thing I might add is uh, my impression is that there is nobody that would like to add seven day a week service more than Rita Hamilton, the uh, library services director. And so uh, she does an incredible job with the limited staff that she has to stretch it. I know a few years ago we had a very healthy debate about when library hours should occur. When we added them uh, in budgets, should we add them in the morning, add them in the evening? Uh, I think this council at that time was very wise to say to the uh, library director, use your best judgment where they're going to the most community impact in terms of um, adding um, uh, library hours. So maybe I, my thought would be maybe have Ms. Hamilton come before this council and talk about uh, staffing strategy and, uh, and her plans. Uh, and obviously she's not responsible for the citizens coming and asking for increase in budget for seven days a week. But she is cheering them on. Uh, let's be clear. <laughs> uh, you know. All right. Uh, all right. With that, any other uh, final comments or questions? All right, we'll, move, we'll see you then in two weeks on uh, budget items. Uh, my understanding is myself and uh, uh, enough of the, the council members have city business to move on to. This item took a little longer than I thought, so we'll move the item on the export readiness initiative to a future agenda item, and therefore this meeting is adjourned.